Well, welcome to another in the ATRE webinar series. My name is Steve Garrett, and today's subject is going to be an introduction into the GM6070 and 6075 transmissions. We're going to take a look at the construction of this transmission, as well as how this basic transmission operates, and some of the little bit of uh, tidbit of diagnostics that you need to know about uh, as an introductory uh, uh, bit of information for this unit. We're going to start out looking at the features, the operation, and of course then the diagnosis, and then a little bit of information on the service regarding the 6070. There's two versions of this transmission that were developed. Uh, they were developed and called the 6070 and of course the 6075. The 6T version transmissions are going to be the replacement for the four-speed front-wheel driver, the 4T uh, version transmissions you've come to obviously know and appreciate through the years. This transmission itself was designed uh, as an introduction for the 2007 model year, and of course it's gone across the board into several of the GM applications as it's replaced its four-speed counterparts. It is part of a family of transmissions, uh, 6040, 6030, 6045, 6050, 6070, 6075, a series of front-wheel drive, uh, six-speed automatic transmissions. Now, it shares a lot of information and a lot of its design with its counterpart, the 6075. So the two brothers here, as far as the front-wheel drive versions, are going to be the 6070 and the 6075. The transmission was co-engineered with Ford Motor Company, and Ford has the patent rights for building their version of the transmission, which they call the 6F50 uh, version transmission. And it is very, very similar, but there will be some minute differences between the transmissions themselves. So some of the parts will interchange, some of the parts will not interchange between the Ford and the GM applications. The most common build point or build uh, uh, plant for the 6070 transmissions themselves is the old 4T65E transmission plant located in Warren, Michigan. This transmission was introduced in 2007 on the Aura the G6, the Saturn Outlook, and the GMC Acadia. It's since then gone across the board into multiple different applications. Primary differences between the 6070 and the 6075, the 6075 is a heavier duty version of the 6070. As you can see, it has a shot peened output carrier, has five pinion output carrier, transfer gear is wider, differential is heavier, and they have a heavier rib case for the 6075. Other than that, the electronics and most of the mechanics of this transmission are the same between the two different versions. Towing capacities are going to vary because, again, the 6075 is going to be designed for the sport utility applications and higher torque and horsepower application engines. So, again, a higher towing capacity with this particular unit. They can be dinghy towed, never to exceed, as you can see, 65 miles an hour, or they can be dolly towed. Either way. So what is so different about the 6T version uh, transmissions? Well, the 6T70 and 75 only use one accumulator. It's a 4, 5, 6 accumulator. They don't have shift valves. Their valves that they have are not called shift valves. They're regulator valves that are basically pulse with modulated uh, shift valves, if you wanted to call it that. But they don't call them actually out as shift valves. They use a series of cell lines that are multifunction cell lines that actually control not only the shift, but the aggressiveness of the shift. They use something called a compensator circuit that actually controls the release of the clutch itself, so it's actually a variable uh, release oil control. They use an internal TCM, so we call that a TECM, Transmission Electrical Hydraulic Control Module, uh, that is internal to the transmission itself. They use what GM refers to as a clutch-to-clutch -clutch shift. I realize it's not a true clutch-to-clutch -clutch shift because they do have a one-way clutch in this transmission. But as far as uh, General Motors is concerned, they call it out of the clutch-to-clutch -clutch shift transmission because you're simply going to be changing which clutch you apply. There are no bands in this transmission. Probably the most important thing to you guys as far as ordering parts for this particular application is to know the RPO code for it. 
As you can see, the all-wheel drive 6070 is called out as an RPO code MH4. The front-wheel drive 6070 is an MH2. The 6075 all-wheel drive is an MH6, and the 6075 front-wheel drive is an MY9. So you're going to find that on your RPO sticker, which of course is located in your glove box, your center console, or your spare tire cover, depending on your application. Uh, they're simply in alphabetical order, three-digit codes. You go until you find the M codes. You're going to have one of these four codes. That's going to be able to ID the transmission for you. They're all 6.4 gears. They're clutch-to-clutch -clutch shift uh, because, again, GM considers it clutch-to-clutch -clutch because you're simply changing which clutch you apply. There are no bands. Use a diode one-way clutch. And, again, that would be one of the differences between this transmission and a Ford uh, application. Not only the clutch friction material is different and the wave plate is different, but the diode one-way clutch is a different design. The TCM is also something different between the Ford and the GM. On the GM, of course, the TCM is mounted inside and it includes your shift solenoids and your pressure switches and transmission temperature sensors. So that's all mounted inside. On the Ford applications, Ford uses an external mounted TCM. All of the 6T70 and 75 family transmissions require Dextron 6 as their oil. Why do you need Dextron 6? Well, these are the reasons that you basically need Dextron 6. It's clutch to clutch shifting, so we've got some changes as far as uh, uh, the actual apply rates of the clutch. So bottom line is they come out with a better quality fluid because reduced sump volumes, higher fluid turnover rates, and the other things that you see on the screen there. That's the reason they're requiring Dex 6 fluid. The dipstick, as you can see, is screwed right into the side of the cover itself. <clears throat> If you, in turn, as we have a little note here, it says studded, studded side cover needs to be retorqued whenever cooler lines are removed. Uh, gasket is not reusable on that side cover. And, of course, you can see the marks on the dipsticks showing you the max mark. When it comes to the electronics on this unit, it is a Bosch-built 32-bit TCM we call a Tecum. The thing you need to know about this is it contains six variable bleed selenides. PCS 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and TCC. Two on and off shift solenoids, which are going to be used for forward and reverse, called shift solenoid 1 and shift solenoid 2. The other thing you need to know about this, as you can note on the screen, uh, there's a bracket, and it's a metal bracket that's snapped over. It basically forces the TCM against a heat sink on the valve body. If you forget to put that bracket on or you forget to snap it over in position, it will cause the TCM to go into what's known as thermal shutdown. What basically happens is the thing quits working, and it goes to default mode. So you don't want that to happen. Make sure that spring-loaded bracket is in place on all of your 60, 70, and 75 transmission applications. This is a look at the Tecum. As you can see, the Tecum itself houses your different solenoids themselves, both the on-off solenoids as well as your your uh, PWM style solenoids, as well as four different pressure switches. Now, <clears throat> pressure switch one, two, three, and four. Those pressure switches are going to be used, as you're going to see, for shift adapts. It tells us when the shift actually occurred, so we can calculate what our shift adapt time actually should be. The converter in this transmission is a squash turbine design, so there's the converter itself is is this cross section is not very large, so it's very thin across the uh, ends of the converter itself. Uh, the reason for that is to fit it in different front wheel drive applications. So it's simply a packaging thing. Uh, one of the other big differences here on this converter is that it contains a lip seal, similar to some of the uh, foreign car converters. You want to make sure that the transmission is in the vertical position, so the input shaft is pointing straight up, and you slide the converter down over top of the seal. Do not have the transmission setting on a bench as you try to uh, slide the converter in like you would a conventional uh, rear-wheel drive application. In other words, what I'm saying is the input shaft has to point up, and you have to pick the converter up and then drop the converter over top of the shaft itself to keep from damaging the lip seal. There are some special holding tools. They're nothing more than T-handles that screw into the converter bolts so that you can actually hold the converter up as you slide it down into place. This thing does use a vein-style oil pump. 
but what's kind of unique with it is the chain driven oil pump like some of the new uh, eight speed units have so it's a remote mounted off axis chain driven oil pump it does have an internal mode switch like other gm transmissions and there's some special programming such as pass programming and pal programming so we've got some programming to control when the transmission will shift both up shifts as well as down shifts we also have sport mode and tap shifts available on this application on many of the different families of vehicles that it goes into. As you can see, the gear ratios are quite a bit different as compared to the 4T65. Uh, this is one of the reasons that this transmission gets about 8% better fuel economy. As you can see, it's got a very deep first gear as compared to the T65. And of course, you've got a, a, a fourth gear overdrive range of about 0 0.74 to 1. And again, very close ratio shifts. So this transmission will get you better fuel economy than what you had with the 4T65E, and this is one of the reasons why. This is simply a layout showing where the different components are in this transmission itself. It looks a lot more complicated than it actually is. The clutches are typically named after what the clutch do, the function of the clutch actually is. Uh, valve body and tecum are bolted together on the side of the transmission itself, so fairly easy access for it. This is a look at the gear train and the clutch stack up in the end cover of the transmission itself. As you can see, we've got all three gear sets shown with the little yellow arrows there, output gear set, input gear set, and reaction gear set, all three of them shown, as well as all the different clutches, the one, two, three, four clutch, uh, the low reverse clutch, two, six clutch, 3-5 reverse clutch, and 4-5-6 clutch, all shown with the blue arrows. Now, <clears throat> again, they're going to name the clutches after what they do, so it makes it very easy to diagnose what you're having problems with. So if you had no second and sixth gear, you obviously have a 2-6 clutch that's giving you troubles. The low one-way clutch, of course, is used uh, in this application. It's a diode-style one-way clutch, and we're showing you that with the red arrow. On the case half, as you can see here, we've got the oil pump, which is the large silver device there just above the oil filter. We're showing you the front differential transfer gear and the, the uh, front differential pinion and ring gear assembly. So that's the layout that you've got. The filter, as you can see here, is non-serviceable. So that means unless you're taking the transmission apart for an overhaul or some repair inside, the hood and the filter is designed for the life of the vehicle, or at least the filter is. Here's my diode one-way clutch. We've seen these in Ford applications for many years. Uh, since this was a co-engineered project, this is one of the things that they adopted in the GM application. But again, the diode one-way clutch that GM uses and the diode one-way clutch that Ford uses are two different diode one-way clutches. Let's take a look at the inputs on this transmission. One of the inputs inside the transmission itself is going to be the internal mode switch. Uh, this is nothing different than we've had as internal mode switches in the year pa years past. we got an A, a B, a C, and a P, our parity circuit. So we're going to simply look at the voltage level on the switch assembly. It's either going to be high, which is about 8.8 .8 volts, or low, which is about 0 volts. And depending on the sequence that it sees, determines which gear range you've actually selected. Now you're also going to notice <coughs> some sequence changing between the gears. That's an anticipation signal so that the controller knows which direction you're physically moving the shift lever. So if we looked at signal A, and you can see we're going from reverse to reverse neutral before we move into neutral, you're seeing obviously the signal go high before we actually get into the neutral gate. That's used for anticipation so we know exactly what the customer is demanding the transmission to do. Your input and output speed sensors are bolted into the transmission case itself. As you can see, the input speed sensor is available externally. The output speed sensor, if you want to gain access to it, the valve body's got to come off the transmission. These are Hall Effect style sensors, both the input and output. You test these sensors because they're a uh, square wave type signal by using a signal generator. The signal generator I have here is a J38522. Uh, that's the one that I've used for many years. What we're basically doing is hooking up to where the sensor would plug into the TECM. You then have an umbilical cord that you would have for your test plate for testing the valve body with this transmission uh, that hooks to the TECM itself. 
so that you can read the speed information off your scan tool. You dial the speed sensor signal generator in to a certain frequency. In this instance, we got it setting at 120 hertz, and it's setting an 8-volt square wave at 50% duty cycle. And when we have it at 120 hertz, you should read approximately somewhere between 100 and 400 RPM on your scan tool. If you read that, then that would mean to us that the sensor is not functioning because we're getting a reading on the scan tool. So the TECA must be processing that information or we would not get the correct reading, obviously, on the scan tool itself. One of the neat things that you can do with this transmission is if for some reason you need to uh, replace the input speed sensor, you can do that uh, with the use of a special tool. This DT tool is nothing more than a glorified piece of uh, welding rod, I guess you might say. It's got a hook on the end of it. You hook it to the sensor, and you can physically then pull that through uh, as you want to replace the sensor. So you hook it to one end of the sensor itself, pull it through as you take the sensor out, hook the new sensor to it, and then simply pull it back through the opposite direction. That makes it very easy to replace the sensor in the vehicle without having to pull the transmission out or pull the transmission apart. Your flood, flood pressure switches will be here for another year or two. Uh, then they're going to be going by the wayside as they make some valve body updates to the 60, 70, 75 transmissions. But for right now, as well as in years past, you've got four different pressure switches we're showing you here with the yellow arrows pointing to the TECM. Those pressure switches tell us when the shift occurs so we can calculate our adapt numbers. So that's the primary function of those pressure switches. They're very low pressure operating, as I'll show you here in a minute, and they simply are either on or an off switch or an open or a closed. On the other side, you're seeing the orange arrows. Those are pointing to all of your different solenoids that we have on the TECM. If you're to have either a pressure switch failure or a solenoid failure with this transmission, you must replace the whole TECM assembly. That's the whole thing there in, in brown. That whole piece would have to be replaced. You cannot buy individual solenoids. They are all... Uh, sonic welded in place, so you can't buy pressure switches, you can't buy cellulose, you can't buy any of those pieces for this. As I told you before, the pressure switches themselves are low pressure uh, switches. The pressure switch is open at about 8 pounds, close at about 12 pounds, and again, they're used to determine what is actually happening with the different clutch regulator valves. So, as you can see on your screen, your transmission fluid pressure switch number one, monitors the 1, 2, 3, 4 regulator valve. The fluid pressure switch number 2 monitors the 3, 5 reverse regulator valve. Switch number 3 monitors the 2, 6 regulator valve. And switch number 4 monitors the 4, 5, 6 regulator valve. And again, those switches are non-serviceable as an individual item. If you had a problem, you would have to replace the switch assembly as part of the tech. -up. Now, you will have driver shift control. In other words, you're going to have the abilities to manually shift this transmission. Uh, like other vehicle applications, uh, you need to be paying attention, obviously, which gear you put it in. And some of those applications, you're going to find that you're going to use a shift lever to make the shift manually. Some you'll actually use paddles that are mounted to the steering wheel. Notice the note on the bottom. It says some models will hit fuel cutoff if you put it, obviously, in first gear and you rev it up to try to make it the shift it will in turn hit fuel cutoff before it obviously hits uh, the second gear shift or the third gear shift or whatever happens shift air actually commanding to occur. Uh, you would not be wanting to start it higher than third gear, so make sure, just like if you're driving any other transmission with driver shift control, you start it out in first gear, then make your shift to second gear and third gear and so forth. Here's your paddle shifts. Many of the different applications that, that uh, utilize the 6070 have paddle shifts. To operate paddle shifts, pretty simple. You simply place the transmission in the M mode, and you then hit the button on your steering wheel. As you can see here, we got a plus button on one side, a minus button on the other side, and you simply hit the button one way or the other way to make the transmission upshift or downshift. Here shows you the Pontiac G6. If you want to go to manual six shift mode with it, you'd have to move the shifter. So a kind of a different philosophy here as compared to the other car we just looked at. 
Uh, this does not have paddle shifts on the steering wheel. This actually makes you to it forces you to manually shift it by moving the shift lever. So you'd place it in the M position and then move the shift lever up or down towards the plus or the minus there, as you can see on the screen in the picture. That will either upshift the transmission or downshift the transmission. Here's another variant of that, showing you the Saturn Outlook in the GMC Acadia Sport Utility Vehicle. Uh, like some of the other transmissions you've dealt with in the years past, like the, the four T40s and, and a few of the other ones, you have buttons that are mounted on the side of the shifter. So you place it, the shifter obviously into the L position, and you then uh, move the button to the plus side or put, punch the plus side button if you want it to upshift, plus the minus, uh, press the minus button if you want it to downshift. This is a look at the electronics of this transmission. So here is a look at the tap up and tap down circuit. As you can see here, we've got voltage being fed to the tap switches, no matter what your configuration is, whether it's in the steering wheel, whether it's obviously in the shifter or wherever it happens to be located. And there's a bank of resistors right here. And as you change the position of these switches, so let's say I did the tap down, I would simply be moving this contact over, forcing the power to go through a 1.5K resistor. That voltage value would be different for a tap down than it would be for a tap up because I'm going through a 4.42K resistor, 4.42 ohm resistor uh, for the tap up shift versus a 1.5K resistor for the tap down. So my whole point to this is the TCM is going to see a different voltage value depending on if you're tapping the transmission into an upshift position or you're commanding it into a downshift position. So <clears throat> by simply monitoring the voltage drop across those switches, the controller can then figure out whether you want to upshift the transmission manually or downshift it. Now let's take a little look at the operation of this transmission. Here's my range reference chart, and what I'm trying to show you in this instance is that each clutch is named after what it does. As you can see, a one, two, three, four clutch is used in first, second, third, and fourth. Okay, a two, six clutch is used in second gear and sixth gear. So by knowing the name of the clutch, you know exactly what that clutch is designed to do. So a malfunction in that particular clutch would affect that particular gear that that clutch is in charge of. Shift solenoid operation, which you need to know at this point about the shift solenoids, is we have two on-off solenoids, shift solenoid one and shift solenoid two. Those are in charge of determining whether the car is going to move forward or the car is going to move backward. So if you look at the sequence, as you can see here, if I chose reverse, the difference between park and reverse is I cycle the shift solenoid number two into the off position. So as we change gear positions, uh, forward versus reverse, we change the sequence of these two cell lines to control which way the car is going to actually move. The other cell lines that you can see over here are my pressure control cell lines for each individual gear range. So controlling each different clutch assembly. So I've got a shift solenoid number five, which is actually your one, two, three, four clutch solenoid. Solenoid number four, which is a two, six solenoid. Solenoid number two, which is a three, five reverse solenoid, and solenoid number three, which is a low reverse uh, four, five, six clutch solenoid. You see, notice, if you notice on the ends of that, you have an NL and an NH stamping here on the end of this chart. That stands for the solenoid is a normally low solenoid or a normally high solenoid. There's if I'm not doing anything to the solenoid, does it allow oil pressure to bypass to go to the clutch, or does it not? And I'll get into that a little bit later on. So we've got two shift solenoids that are on-offs. They're normally closed, and they're ground side controlled by the controller itself. I've got three VBS, or variable bleed solenoids, that are normally low solenoids. That's TCC solenoid, number four, and number five solenoid. And I got three variable bleed solenoids are normally high solenoids. That's the pressure control solenoid and your number two and your number three solenoids. And again, as I alleviated to a little bit earlier, 
Uh, normally high solenoid, when the solenoid is turned off, pressure is allowed to travel to the clutch. And normally low solenoid, if the solenoid is turned off, no pressure is allowed to travel to the clutch. These VBS, or variable bleed solenoids, are all high side duty cycle controlled solenoids. They run at about 3,000 cycles per second, have about 5.5 ohms resistance at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The controller is current limited, so if they're short, a solenoid is short, uh, obviously it could not damage the controller, but it obviously would end up affecting the operation of the transmission. Feed voltage for the solenoids is regulated to about 9 volts. Uh, typical of Bosch, they use an internal voltage regulator to regulate voltage internally to just about everything in the transmission. So shift solenoid number one and two, those are my on-off solenoids. They're used to control which direction the car moves, either forward or reverse. Your variable bleed solenoids, which is your number two, three, four, and five, they control which shift occurs and how aggressive the shift actually is. Now, this thing does have a cleaning process that you can activate with a scan tool for solenoid cleaning. It also goes through a predetermined solenoid cleaning process when you're actually in park or neutral range and that cycling occurs about every 30 seconds. So you will see something happen on your pressure gauge about every 30 seconds. That is considered normal with this transmission. When we look at the valve breakdown, there are two basic types of valves in this transmission itself. One design valve is called a clutch select valve. One design valve is called a clutch regulator valve. So we don't have what we used to have with some of the other transmissions like we had shift valves before. We've got clutch select valves and clutch regulator valves. Clutch select valves control which clutch is allowed to apply and release. The regulators simply control how aggressive that apply or release is going to actually be. You're going to have two parts of the valve body. Your upper half of the valve body is going to have 10 valves total mounted in it. Manual valve, clutch select valve number two, uh, 456 regulator valve, clutch select valve number three, TCC regulator valve, TCC control valve, your 2-6 regulator valve, your isolator valve, 3-5 reverse clutch regulator valve, and your pressure regulator valve. The lower valve body, you're going to have five valves and one accumulator. You're going to have a 1-2-3-4 clutch regulator valve, 1-2-3-4 clutch boost valve, 4-5-6 clutch valve, 3-5 boost valve, your actuator feed level valve, and of course your 4-5-6 accumulator. They're all located in the lower valve body. So if we looked at the function of all this stuff, what you would see is you would see that the shift solenoid number one controls the clutch select valve number two. The shift solenoid number two controls the select clutch select valve number three. Your TCC solenoid controls your TCC operation. Your pressure control solenoid number one controls your line pressure. Your solenoid number two controls your 3-5 reverse regulator valve. Your solenoid number three controls your four, five, six regulator valve. Your solenoid number four controls your two, six regulator valve. Your solenoid number five controls your one, two, three, four clutch regulator valve. So as you can see, each valve is controlled by a separate solenoid. Well, that pretty well concludes our presentation on an introduction to the 6T70. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I do not see any questions in the queue at this time. So with that said, have a nice day, and we'll see you next time.